on this episode of China Unscripted, America's decades-long failure to confront China, how the Chinese Navy surpassed the U.S.'s, and what could happen next. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Kanesta. Joining us once again is Captain Jim Fennell, the former director of intelligence and information operations for the U.S. Pacific Fleet. Jim, thanks for joining us again. Thanks, Chris, Shelley, and Matt. Glad to be with you all again. So I know you've been watching the Chinese Navy for a long time, in particular in the South China Sea. And as I understand it, you were one of the first people who uh, really raised the alarm about what the Chinese Communist Party was doing there. So what happened? Well, I, I certainly wasn't the first, uh, but uh, I probably was one of the first to actually make public statements uh, back in 2013 and 2014, uh, warning about where China was headed. Of course, many of us uh, have been watching this for over the previous decade, going back to the 2000 time frame when China started really ramping up their naval production uh, and kind of moving from the uh, brown water navy that they had, the coastal navy that they had, into a kind of a far seas navy. Uh, and those beginning steps occurred in that decade, the first decade of the new century, uh, when China started really uh, building new, new, new classes of ships and submarines that were more capable, and then they started deploying them out uh, around 2006, 2007. They started deploying their ships outside of that first island chain that extends down from Japan through uh, the Ryukyu Islands to Taiwan uh, and then down through the Philippines. It's when we started to see Chinese uh, submarines and uh, surface ship action groups, numbers of surface ships, uh, head out into the Philippine Sea and other waters. And so uh, for the last 15 years, uh, the Chinese have been continuing on that trajectory. And now, as we've seen with the recent release of this uh, Defense Department report on China's military, uh, they, they acknowledged for the first time that China's Navy is actually bigger uh, than the U.S. Navy. Is that new that they, they've said that? Uh, it's the first time that the U.S. Department of Defense has publicly acknowledged that. So that's a very good sign. I'm glad that that was in there. I'm just wondering, I do want to get back to a sort of how you guys sort of became aware of what China was doing in the South China Sea. But uh, uh, I'm just wondering, the Chinese fleet is bigger than the U.S. How does it compare in terms of actual capability, though? Right. So you, you raised the point that's really critical, which is when you say something's bigger, then there's the assumption that it's better. And so there's been Am a lot I of... right? Uh, <laughs> there's a lot, a lot of people that have criticized the, the, the numbers and the number of ships and said it's kind of immaterial. And so they try to measure other things like tonnage, how much actual weight is in the water. Uh, then there was a studies done during the uh, previous administration where they talked about battle force missiles, the number of missiles and the number of orders that could come off of a, a certain amount of ships and fleets. And so there's been great debate about that. Uh, and we like to focus in the United States on our aircraft carriers and the aircraft that fly off and the bombs that can be delivered from them uh, and, the, and the cruise missiles that can land attack cruise missiles that our ships can launch. But the area that I've always focused on, which is the one that I think is the most important for a great power competition with the PRC, is in, in the ability of fleets to be able to fight and sink each other and, and defeat each other at sea. And in that regard, China is not only superior in the number of ships that they have, but also in the number of anti-ship cruise missiles that they have. For instance, the YJ-18, which has got like a 300 kilometer uh, range, it, out, it outranges uh, any kind of missile that the U.S. Navy currently has. Uh, now, for the four or five years, six years, people have been working on uh, developing anti-ship cruise missiles for the U.S. Uh, Navy. Uh, but in that regard, we're still way behind the Chinese, which just about every one of their major combatants that gets produced uh, has more uh, missiles of this type than, than we do. For instance, this new type 055 Renhai class cruiser has 112 vertical launch cells, you know, like a cell that can hold a, a, an individual missile. So that's 112, uh, and they've got eight of those uh, that are under production. Six of them are almost complete, uh, and the first one was uh, commissioned here in January of this year. So uh, the Chinese are pumping out a lot of ships and submarines and their air forces, naval air forces and regular air forces that are equipped with anti-ship cruise missiles. 
specifically designed, the whole structure of the Chinese power projection capability is designed to sink the U.S. Pacific Fleet. And for the last 30 years, the U.S. Navy, under both Democrat and Republican administrations, was focused on uh, conflicts in the Middle East. And so we, we kind of squandered 30 years of uh, preparation uh, for this kind of conflict. And we hadn't really done it uh, until the Cold War with the Soviet Union. And when I first joined the Navy, our Navy was designed and trained uh, people and personnel manned and equipped to uh, defeat the Soviet Navy, you know, in the, in the Kola Peninsula, in the GI, uh, Greenland, Iceland, UK Gap, out in, the, out in the Atlantic side, and then in the Pacific, you know, to uh, attack and defeat the Soviet Navy uh, in the Sea of Japan, in the, in the Northwest Pacific. Uh, that, was our, that was our reason for existing. And for 30 years, we kind of went away from thinking that we had to worry about other navies. And like 92, 94, we published new doctrine in the Navy called uh, or From the Sea in 1992 and then Forward From the Sea in 1994, which talked about the Navy's mission was to support the joint force, the Army, the Marine Corps, the Air Force, for conducting uh, uh, war uh, over land. And so we were engaged with you know, putting uh, naval forces uh, and naval ordnance uh, ashore in fights in Iraq, Kuwait, Afghanistan, Syria, that whole area. And we neglected, as an institution, in my opinion, we neglected the potential for the further rise of the PRC and their focus on naval warfare. And uh, we are now starting to, I think, under this administration, wake up to that. Uh, but we got a lot of work to do. So let me ask about the Chinese anti-aircraft carrier missiles. Uh, is is their technology better than U.S. technology, or do they simply have more missiles? Well, uh, the the missiles that you're talking about, the DF-21, Dongfeng 21D, uh, and the DF-26, are two missiles that were specifically built and designed uh, to sink our aircraft carriers. The Chinese call them anti-carrier ballistic missiles, uh, and that technology. There's some evidence to suggest that the Chinese stole this, some of this technology from the U.S. back uh, in the Cold War, which we had let go fallow uh, after the, when the wall came down and we moved to this forward from the sea concepts that we didn't really think we needed that. But the Chinese worked on it and, and developed it into these missiles. And as you saw here in the last uh, week or two, there's reports that the Chinese launched a salvo of, of four possibly DF-26s, which have, you know, a they can range Guam, they the range from China to Guam. So it's you know almost a 15, 1600 um, nautical mile range. Uh, they shot those down into a closure area south of Hainan Island, but north of the Parasons into a little uh, closure area. Right, and those were, those were land-based missiles. And yes, they were, these DF-26 and DF-21 are land-based ballistic missiles specifically designed and supported by their space assets and other intelligence resources to target uh, moving aircraft carriers at sea. And uh, th that test, we don't know if there was moving ships in the closure area uh, in this south of Hainan Island, uh, but regardless, it was a lot of uh, interest in this launch because it's the first time that we've had uh, publicly released information of the Chinese launching uh, either one of the Dongfeng 21 or 26 at a sea, a sea area. Most of their launches previously have been conducted going uh, west into their desert targeting ranges. Well, this seems crazy to me. Like, you know, the Chinese Communist Party has openly talked about how it considers itself at war with the United States. They built missiles specifically designed to sink U.S. aircraft carriers. And only now is the U.S. kind of realizing, like, wait a minute, this, they are, the, they're talking about us. Yeah, I, it, there's two sides of that story. There will be some that'll say that I'm exaggerating the neglect by the U.S. Uh, Department of Defense, and they'll be defensive about the fact that, you know, we had other things going on, and we were quietly working behind the scenes, and we knew what was going on. And to that, I would just say, well, there may be pockets of places where people were warning. I was one of them when I was on active duty, and the people that I worked with but in my in my staff at Pacific Fleet when I was at the 7th Fleet. Um, and there were pockets of people that understood this. But in terms of institutional impact, there was no impact. We did not build a fleet 
that matched or kept pace with the development of the PRC Navy. I mean, and, and the fact of that, of what I've been saying for 20 years is borne out in this report, uh, which I've been critical of some elements of the report, but let me just say, the fact is that report said unequivocally that the Chinese Navy is bigger than the United States Navy. And that should hit people like a ton of bricks uh, that we got to this point in 2020 that we paid billions of dollars a year into the Defense Department and all of a sudden, we just got this, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I would say it was a very subdued statement, but it said that the Chinese Navy is bigger than the U.S. Navy. And you haven't seen anybody talking about it too much on national news. I mean, it's gotten a couple of lines here and there, but we're so focused on the election. I get that. But the, the fact that we have an admission that the Chinese Navy is bigger than the U.S. Navy should should send shock, shock waves through the American electorate. I mean, did you, did you hear that Nancy Pelosi got her hair cut? I think that's pretty big news. She actually just got it washed and blow-dried. Wow. <laughs> but, yeah. I mean, do you think that the Chinese Communist Party, you know, it launched those anti-aircraft missiles now because of geopolitical things that were happening? Or is this just the next step in their preparation for an eventual naval war? Well, I, you know, I'm not in the government, so I don't have access to classified information anymore. But given what I know about that missile system from years, from almost two decades, I would, you know, bet the farm that uh, this was a, a political signal that uh, Beijing was sending to the United States over, uh, you know, comments and speeches by the Secretary of State at the Nixon Library on 23 July, uh, you know, Communist China and the Future of the Free World. That was the title of the speech. Uh, arms sales announcements to Taiwan, uh, Taiwan Strait transits by the Barry and the, or the Mustin and the Halsey, uh, all, all kinds of things that China is very an an uh, anxious about and upset about. But uh, it seems clear to me that it was a, clearly meant as a signal to us. And China, again, what, you know, they as salami slicing, they slice very, very thin. They could have launched those missiles and then all so said, no, by the way, we launched them at moving targets, and here's a video. They had they had aircraft up, they had ships in the area. They could have prop they probably have all that video, but they're not going to tell us that. They're going to let us sweat it out and worry about it uh, and let the international community debate it. And then the next time they need to raise the, the, the temperature, they'll launch it at a ship or something. So they've controlled the escalation uh, regarding these missiles very well over the last decade, and uh, we need to be careful of it. It's a real threat. Now, you mentioned that there were pockets of resistance within the, the Defense Department, kind of raising the issue about uh, the threat of China. You were part of that. How do you feel your warnings were received by the U.S. government and previous administrations? Uh, well, locally in Hawaii, at the U.S. Pacific Command and Pacific Fleet, and farther down downrange in Japan with the 7th Fleet and the forces out there, they all understood the threat. I mean, they were living in you know, this, the, the fleet and the Air Forces that we, and the Marines that we have out there, they see it every day. So there was not a lot of convincing, uh, you know, you didn't have to convince those folks about what was happening. Uh, but as soon as you started, you know, heading more towards the East Coast and the, and the D.C. area, that's where things become very political and, washed and, and, you know, debated amongst all the many tasks that the U.S. is taking on. And so it wasn't received well in some circles. And clearly the previous administration, in my opinion, had a do not provoke, do not upset China mindset. Well, I think a pretty clear example of that is uh, what happened in the Scarborough Shoal in 2012. That really changed the dynamic in the region. Uh, why, don't, why don't you tell us what happened there? Well, the uh, 2012 Scarborough Shoal incident, uh, in my opinion, is one of the worst foreign policy disasters that America has uh, endured in the Asia Pacific region since maybe the fall of Saigon in 75. And I say that because um, the Republic of the Philippines is a treaty ally with the United States. And in April of 2012, uh, the Philippine Navy ship uh, Gregorio del Pilar had just finished a kind of a circuit of the South China Sea where they were looking at and resupplying their outpost, the Philippine outpost there. And they were heading back to Manila and they got word that the Chinese commercial interest of uh, commercial ships and fishing vessels had uh, kind of essentially descended upon Scarborough Shoal, which is 140 miles north-northwest of uh, Manila, well inside the Philippines' 
200 mile exclusive economic zone. And so the Gregorio del Pilar was directed to go up there and take a look and they did. And when they got there, they uh, basically confronted a couple of these Chinese commercial ships and they sent their uh, sailors aboard and uh, they said, hey, what are, you, what are you doing here? You're inside our EZ, let me see what's in your hold. And they found giant clams and coral and things of that nature. And so they recorded it, they put it on video and they kind of got the word out. Uh, and it got kind of hit the, the community in Asia and saw what was happening. And by the next day, uh, the Chinese, the next day or two, the Chinese had uh, basically uh, sent out a fleet of about 10 or 11 uh, Chinese uh, maritime law enforcement vessels, the, uh, the Chinese Coast Guard, uh, uh, Ministry of Fishing. Uh, uh, anyway, so there were five dragons that constituted what were called maritime law enforcement agencies of the PRC before G consolidated them in 2013. And those elements of those five agencies all came out along with Chinese Navy war vessels that were well over the horizon, but were clearly sent there to back up any activity that could occur at the shoal. And you basically had a standoff between the Filipinos that were there and their fishing vessels, that their small, small fishing vessels that the Philippines had, uh, bunker boat style, very outrigger canoe kind of things that were doing much smaller scale fishing uh, than what the Chinese were doing, which is kind of an industrial scale destruction of the coral reefs inside that shoal. And uh, there was a standoff. So then there became this debate inside the U.S. government about what, what should happen. And, you know, a lot of people like myself said, hey, the Philippines is a treaty ally. We're, we're, we're bound to help them. And there were people uh, back in Washington, specifically in the administration, that said, no, uh, we're not going to get involved with this. And maybe we're being drugged into a conflict and all these kind of things. And the gist of it was is that the U.S. didn't say anything in defense of the Philippines against the PRC's uh, bullying behavior. And from April through June, we didn't do anything. And in the meantime, the State Department was negotiating, kind of leading a, a negotiation with the Chinese uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, representative, Madam Fu Ying, and the Filipino uh, Foreign Affairs representative, and trying to come up with some kind of an agreement. And they apparently came to some agreement that said that both would leave uh, the shoal on June 15th, uh, 2012. And on June 15th, 2012, the Filipinos dutifully left and the Chinese didn't. And since June 16th, 2012, China's basically had sovereign control over the Scarborough Shoal. It's theirs. And they acquired it without firing a shot. And the U.S. has some had culpability in that for failing to stand up to a treaty ally. And the Philippines know it. And President Duterte, even though he's not a you know, he's known for not liking the United States, but he's pointed out repeatedly that the United States failed to come to the, the, the Philippines defense in that situation, even though the president then was Aquino. Uh, and it also sent a signal uh, to the other nations in the region. And I was there, I was still in uniform, and I would meet with my counterparts from all the different navies around the region to, and talk to their governments. And it was clear that people were really questioning what the heck was going on, because on the one hand, the, the Obama administration was touting the pivot to the Pacific or the rebalance to the Pacific. But on the other hand, we let a treaty ally just uh, basically, you know, have part of their territory taken from the, the PRC, and we didn't really say anything. Yeah, I remember when we when we went to the Scarborough Shoal, and that was um, I think 2016. 2016, and this was just after Duterte had been um, uh, had taken office. And when we got there, because we took one of those small Filipino fishing boats. We get there and, you know, we're maybe like six or 7,000 feet from these giant Chinese Coast Guard and maybe maritime militia ships that were surrounding the shoal. And like the captain of our boat was like, I, I don't want to go into the shoal because you have these two Coast Guard ships guarding it. And, you know, we found out that his, his son had been like rammed by the Chinese boat. And so there was a lot of fear and it was as if China, the PRC, was allowing Filipinos to fish there, but only... Uh, if they were, you know, willing to do it on China's terms, despite, as you pointed out, being in the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines. And it was a very intimidating feeling uh, just being out there in these tiny little fishing boats surrounded by huge Chinese ships. Yeah. And the Chinese have, since 2012, up until now, eight years, they have allowed the Filipinos to come in and, you know, get some table scraps, if you will, every once in a while. But Whenever there's a dust up or any kind of disagreement, 
uh, you know, they were quick to push them all out for a period of time before they let them back in. So it's a classic case of a, a bully picking on a smaller guy or country in this case. And uh, the other guy who's your brother, that would be the United States, didn't anything, didn't do anything to help out its little brother. Now, I think since then, the United States, uh, you know, we've tried to, under this administration. My my impression is with all the the deployments and activity of our Navy down there in the South China Sea, we're trying to reverse that, but it, you can't reverse it all be, unless you're willing to go to war. And I don't think anybody wants to do that. So it's kind of a fait accompli for the Philippines. Well, I'm curious. In 2013, the Obama administration did begin freedom of navigation operations in the uh, well, in the entire region, including the South China Sea. Uh, how effective was that if the U.S. had already sent the signal that they're really not willing to confront China? Well, we've been doing freedom of navigation operations since the 70s around the world. So that's a, that you need to set that kind of context. We did it against the Soviets. We did it against any nation that we have disagreements with. We even do freedom of navigation operations against the Philippines for some of their kind of excessive straight baseline claims that they have in the, in, in the Philippine archipelago. So it's not a, a military thing. It's run by the State Department, the Freedom of Navigation Program. And it's basically uh, a way of documenting uh, law to make sure that we don't allow people to, or nations to uh, get excessive uh, claims in accordance with the United Nations Convention Law of the Sea. Uh, and so in this case, uh, the Obama administration was doing uh, freedom of navigation operations, as you said, in 2013, uh, but they were not in the same nature as we have right now. They were they were not uh, every month. They were not uh, highly publicized. They were after the fact, um, and they were kind of low key. And they certainly did not have the kind of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of them were criticized for being kind of innocent passage. We would send a ship through uh, inside or just outside of 12 nautical miles of one of the disputed areas, and we would just steam right by, and we wouldn't stop and operate. And so I think uh, the difference today with this administration is. We're, we're doing more operations in, in the word operation, freedom of navigation operation can mean many things. And so I think they're doing more operations where we're actually pulling up inside of 12 nautical miles and actually operating for a little bit of time to send the signal to China that we don't recognize your claim. And I think that's the big, the, been the biggest difference. But as you say, how effective is that overarching to the overarching uh, trajectory of where China is going, and have we deterred them from their desire and aim and plan to have total ownership of the South China Sea inside that nine dash line? And to that extent, uh, I don't think we're making much. Uh, I, I think we're doing a little bit more now because it's a whole of government approach that this administration has taken. And so you can't look at things just from a, a fawn only perspective. You have to look at it across the whole, you know what the Chinese call comprehensive national power, what we would call diplomatic information, military and economic uh, levers of power. So in this case, I think the Trump administration has been more effective because they're using economic tools, they're using information much more, they're using the economy uh, and, and, and the military of all kind of all four areas have been ramped up uh, as compared to the previous administration. What do you think of the uh, sanctions that the U.S. government just put on these Chinese companies that were involved in the island building in the South China Sea? Well, I think it's fantastic. I mean, it's I mean, what, what would have happened if they had done that in 2012, 2013, 2014? Now, you, some people may argue, well, we didn't know all the details of that. Well, then that's an intelligence failure if we didn't. And I was in and we can talk about that sometime. But the fact is today that we're doing that is just another signal to Beijing that we're not going to let you get away with things anymore. And we're going to hold you to account, and we're going to give you, as uh, even was discussed today in some of the Chinese press, they're upset about this, the, the State Department and the treating of diplomats of reciprocal, uh, you know, reciprocity. Well, guess what? Uh, the, you, the Chinese have been using that concept of reciprocity for years, and this administration is effectively using it uh, as a tool to combat China's expansionism, in my opinion. So when you were talking earlier about the freedom of navigation operations within 12 miles, um, is that within the 12 miles of the, the islands that they've built in the South China Sea? Some of those uh, disputed areas uh, are inside the, the seven, where the seven artificial islands are, yes. And then, you know, do you think the Scarborough Shoal incident in 2012 
did that have an effect on China's artificial island building, which was not in the Scarborough Shoal, but in other areas of the South China Sea? Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, I've had a lot of conversations about that over the years. And I think where I come down on this is that what China learned at Scarborough was a kind of a, I think it shocked them a little bit. They didn't realize that when they stuck their finger into that thing, that there wouldn't be any resistance from the United States and that we would just sit back and let them take it. And that probably impacted some of their longer term planning and their timelines. And so they went back and they recalculated and said, hey, we can go faster and quicker now because the United States under this administration, the previous administration, doesn't appear to be willing to uh, engage, you know, push back against us in any way, shape or form. And so let's go ahead and start accelerating our plan to build these artificial islands. Um, now, you mentioned um, sort of uh, the, the a possible intelligence failure as far as uh, no, the U.S. knowing what China was doing in the South China Sea and building up the artificial island. You said you had something you could go deeper into? Well, I, I was saying that it would be considered an intelligence failure if we didn't know what they were doing when they started building those islands. And I can just say, you know, I, all I can say at this point is we knew. <laughs> we knew what was going on. I was watching it. We were watching it. And uh, people were warned about it. And so we just didn't do anything. So what's at stake if China does take control of the South China Sea? Well, uh, we I just watched a video this week on uh, retired Admiral Owens, former vice chief of uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, former Sixth Fleet commander, runs the Sanya Group in China. He's uh, very uh, engaged with the Chinese, a friend of China, if you'd say. And he even mentioned it, that about $5 trillion worth of, of worth of goods uh, steam through the South China Sea. So it's an important waterway, just like the Mediterranean, just like the Persian Gulf. It's an area where the world's, the global economy, uh, their goods and services come in and out of, from Europe to, to, to Asia and back and forth. And so it's a vitally important area. And just because no commercial vessels have been disrupted to date, at least as far as we know, that doesn't mean that it won't happen. It doesn't mean that it's any less of a threat if the Chinese now control everything inside the Nine Dash Line and they are the dominant military force. We have some uh, reports over the years where the Chinese have leaked out little pieces here and there, and they're in, you know in the in the public domain. They'll talk about you know commercial corridors so that they would have much like in the air where you have commercial airline corridors. The Chinese have had some reports that talking about we'll have commercial maritime corridors and we will require ships to check in and identify themselves. And uh, if they have Beto, that's so much easier. We'll all, we'll all follow you. And uh, depending on who you are and what country you're from, maybe we'll have to divert you to take a look what's in your hold. So it's about, it's not about necessarily overt, you know, actions of sinking, uh, you know, uh, big merchant tankers with uh, holds full of iPhones. It's more about their ability to strangle, strangle uh, certain nations and control them through, you know, very delicate means at the initial onset of a conflict. Yeah, I mean, I can see how, like, for an individual uh, commercial ship, it's much easier for the captain of that ship to just, uh, you know, agree to take a slightly different route, for example, than, you know, to, to you know, say, oh, you know, you can't tell me what to do, we're going to stand up, right? And so then that's just like one thin salami slice, right? And then, you know, over the years, it's not just take a new route, but also let us see what's in your hold. And then you just get more and more slices through that because the commercial vessels and those commercial shipping companies aren't going to want to fight back. Correct. I mean, everything that goes at sea is just like the air and just like rail, everything in a global economy that's just in time, uh, you know, supply chains, the, every every minute every of every hour of every day is is money. And so... If the Chinese can disrupt, uh, you know, some supply chain from the United States to China, or from from Germany to Japan, or whatever it is, it's going to cost somebody thousands and millions of dollars. And so, if you can affect that, you can get you can get people to comply. You know, if I grab your little pinky finger and I squeeze it really hard, you, you're going to listen to me and do what I say. Are there concerns that you know, if China were to be able to control the entire? nine dash line area in the South China Sea that they would also try to control the airspace over that area? 
Yeah, there's a lot of people are, you know, we've been waiting since 2013 to see if China would declare an air defense identification zone in the South China Sea like they did in the East China Sea. And this gets down to a, an issue of what they, you know, their understanding and interpretation of international norms and laws are different than the rest of the world in many ways. They declared that air defense identification zone as some kind of like uh, area where people or where aircraft, no matter what kind of aircraft, would have to check in and seek to get approval uh, from the PRC. And then they found out through whatever reason that it was almost laughable, their declaration was laughable because of the volume of commercial air traffic that goes in and out of China and into Japan and into Korea and over China into Europe and all that. Literally millions of planes in a year are flying through there and they realized that maybe that wasn't the right purpose of the air defense identification zone. The identific aid is, as they call it, the aid is, is really about allowing nations to defend themselves from what they perceive to be hostile aircraft that may be trying to come in and attack them. And, and in that case, you use the ADIS to, uh, you know, query and, and target and, and, you know, localize an aircraft that you cannot identify that you think is a hostile, a bogey. Uh, it's not used to check and control every, every aircraft that comes into that zone. And so I think the Chinese, after they did that, they got a lot of, uh, you will say, egg on their face. And uh, people kind of laughed at them in public and said, what do you guys, you don't even understand what this means. So I think that's in part why they haven't really declared anything in the South China Sea. That said, I think that they would love to still be able to do that and at some point be able to control things. They want to change international norms because they think every international institution that was created after World War II was specifically created to disadvantage China. They got a huge chip on their shoulders and are paranoid about these things. So what does China's activities in the South China Sea mean for Taiwan? Well, that's a, I mean, that's really the key in my opinion. It's, it, it allows them to have control over, control the global economy in some sense. But from a military perspective, the South China Sea gives China the southern vector to a, you know, attack Taiwan and really put a lot of stress on the Taiwan military and the U.S. And if we, the U.S. Navy, cannot operate as a, from a bastion in the South China Sea because Chinese forces that are operating from these three major uh, naval and air bases down at Mischief, Fiery Cross, and Subi Reefs, and they have ships that are all over the Nine Dash Line, and now they have you know bombers and fighters that can fly out from there, it makes it really hard for the, the United States to come to the defense of Taiwan if we can't present another attack vector towards the mainland of China or Hainan Island where their South Sea Fleet headquarters are and their, their uh, you know, Southern Theater Command headquarters are in Zhongchong. So if we can't affect that because we can't get into that area, then that's a, that's a win for them. And then it, it's a double whammy because not only don't, are we uh, prevented from using that uh, battle space for our advantage, we're now also now at the mercy of the Chinese who can use that battle space to launch attacks into Taiwan. Southern Taiwan and also out into the Philippine Sea. And if China was able to then take Taiwan, what would that mean for the military balance of power in the first and second island chain? That's the uh, unsinkable aircraft carrier that China would gain. Uh, they wouldn't have to build an aircraft carrier. If they were able to take Taiwan, uh, they would be able to then launch attacks uh, everywhere. And if you look back at history, you, you look what the Jap Imperial Japanese forces did Taiwan was in the, under their control. It was a key element uh, for their success in the Pacific. Now, they ultimately lost, but for many years, they were able to operate from Taiwan to launch attacks at all U.S. forces and allied forces into the South Pacific, into Japan. Well, they came from Japan, so I mean, they controlled that whole area. And if China were able to uh, control Taiwan, uh, the next uh, you know, obvious target would be Japan. Well, so it seems like the U.S., at least previous administrations, have really failed in understanding and standing up to the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, do you think this was, do you think like Obama himself did just not understand the situations or were there people in his administration who were giving him bad advice? Was this an issue with think tanks or where, where, how did we get into this mess? I, Chris, I think it's not a matter of people not understanding, at least Everybody that's at that level is really smart. They're, they're very smart people, probably much smarter than me. But it's, it's about a belief system. 
and a belief system in this idea of engagement. It's an ideological belief that says China doesn't really have nefarious intentions. So it's a downplaying of Chinese communism. We hear a lot of academics say China's not really a Marxist or a Marxist Leninist nation. They're not really practicing communism. So we can't really call them a communist nation. And I understand and kind of maybe in a in some sense they're not pure communists. But in another sense, they're following all the kinds of uh, uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures that uh, Marx and Lenin, uh, uh, you know, exemplified in the Soviet Union in different ways and different manifestations. But this idea that this one party, the state, will control the means of production, will control who can say and go and live and do what, as we're seeing with the, the virus and how they're, uh, you know, enacting uh, these controls for uh, their citizens, the social credit system, all of these kind of things, that, that embodies communism. And so that's what China is. Yet in Washington over the last two decades, when you talk like that, when you spoke to these educated, highly intelligent people, they looked at you like you had three eyes. And they said, no way, man, that's not going to happen. Uh, they're not like that. And if we just engage with them, and if we have track two dialogue and track 1.5 dialogues from my think tank to their think tank at Kicker, things will all go uh, really well and we'll We'll moderate them and they'll come to adopt and accept international norms and things will get better and tensions will get less and oh everybody's uh, you know boats will rise. Well, that worked for a while when Deng opened up, uh, but what they can't explain today, and and they won't, is the fact that over that course of the 40 years, the Chinese kept militarizing, they kept building the military, and Admiral Owens and others will tell me, well, they built the military because they're a big power and. They need to have a military because all big countries have militaries. Yeah, okay. Well, they're building that military to use it. And where are they going to use it? Who are they going to use it against? And why are they all of a sudden now in, you know, August, September of 2020, uh, you know, lashing out against India, having border disputes where 20 soldiers from India were murdered by Chinese soldiers who may have lost up to 30? Why are they lashing out at Taiwan since... Uh, Tsai Ing-wen and the DPP were reelected and now flying what we think are almost daily uh, recon or not just reconnaissance, but flights around Taiwan and probes uh, from Chinese ships and submarines around Taiwan, tightening that noose on a daily basis. Why are they lashing out at the United States? Why are they shooting missiles into the South China Sea? Uh, why are they going after the language in Mongolia and talking about Mongolian language has to be curtailed? Why are they re-upping re the issues with Tibet all of a sudden in the last couple of weeks? I mean, why do they still have a visceral hatred of Japan for a war that was sought, fought 75 years ago? You just, you just look at a nation like that and say, if the things that the people that were in charge of our China hands community had told us for 40 years were accurate, then why are we seeing all these manifestations? And because it's a political season, there are a few of these people that will say, well, it's because of this administration, but that's just a pure lie. And we know that's a lie because we've watched them for 20 years continue to move down this trajectory. I mean, it's interesting because during, you know, Xi Jinping and also Hu Jintao had continuously talked about Marxism, Leninism as the guiding ideology for socialism with Chinese characteristics. So it's not like they said, oh, Marxism, Leninism has gone away. They're like, oh, this is our foundation. You brought up uh, the Chinese Communist Party's aggression in in India and uh, and Taiwan and Tibet and, and southern Mongolia or Inner Mongolia, as the as Chinese call it. Um, so, you know, from your perspective, what is the political reason that they're doing this now in 2020, uh, whereas they seem to be much less aggressive before? Well, I personally. I think there's like two schools of thought on this. And the first school is there's significant factions inside the Chinese Communist Party and Xi is very tenuously uh, holding power. And so what we're seeing is manifestations of his frustration uh, from attacks from factions. Uh, and therefore it's very dangerous because he could lash out and do anything to stay in power. Okay. There's another theory or the one that I kind of hold to, which is, there's an election coming up on November 3rd, and they don't want a certain guy to get elected. And they are going to do everything in their power to destabilize the world and create chaos so that it feeds the narrative that we hear in certain circles uh, domestically in America, which says, you know, everything's going
going to hell in a handbasket and one guy's responsible. Right. But I mean, it's pretty clear that th there's a correlation over the last, you know, three and a half years of the Trump administration that relations with China have gotten tenser. So, you know, why shouldn't America go back to the era of the Clinton and Bush and Obama administrations and try to smooth out that relationship? Well, the answer to that would, on one level, would be, well, you have to ask all those people that were unemployed over the course of those previous 25, 30 years that lost their jobs that were offshored from America to China, ask them what they think about that and putting them back in power and all the jobs that were created in the last three and a half years. Do they want to have those jobs go away again? I don't think they do. Secondly, you have to ask yourself, if China's in charge and they set up a, social, a digital currency like they're talking about doing now, and they and their the rinby becomes uh, the uh, you know an international currency, and they set up this digital currency. Uh, how soon is it before they start mandating that nations around the world follow the same suit, and we go into a social credit system that controls where we can go and not go? You know, in China right now, over the course of this virus, you can't get out of your housing complex or your apartment without a an iPhone or a phone, a Huawei phone probably, that has an app that has a, a, you know, a red check, a yellow check, or a green check. You can't get out of your house. And then you can't walk down the street and cross the sidewalk because the sidewalk uh, uh, indicators can tell if you're uh, not a green check, that you're clean for COVID, and they will never turn green and you'll stand there at the corner and not allowed to cross. So, I, I mean, that's the question I have is if we go back to engagement, how soon before we're all living in a system like that where there's no freedom or liberty and where we're told what to think, what to say, we're demanded on things to say and how to live. And uh, I'm not saying we want to go into a war, but we have to have the ability to push back against what China's doing. And I think in the region, whether you talk to when you guys were in Hong Kong, I mean, what do the people of Hong Kong think about going back to China running Hong Kong? What do the people of Taiwan think about it? And I think it's the same thing in America. Ask all the people, the 60,000 people that die every year from opioids, from fentanyl that come from China. Let's ask their mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and boyfriends and girlfriends and husbands and wives what they think about losing uh, all of their loved ones to opioids that came from China. It seems to me that if we go back to that, we're going to be placed in a position of subservience to communist China. But will continuing to you know, stand up to China or, you know, sometimes it's framed as, you know, the U.S. is provoking China or uh, something like that. Like, will that lead us to war with China? Well, that's the, that's kind of the argument we get from the China hands community, the, uh, the Kissinger School, I like to call them, folks like Admiral Owens or former uh, State Department official Susan Thornton or uh, the names could go on and on. But these folks uh, like to characterize things in that term. It's either we go along and engage and have, you know, no people to people exchanges like China wants, or it's thermonuclear war. I mean, it's like there's, it's like two extremes and there's nothing in between. And so I think we've seen over the last three and a half years that you can actually push back against China in certain areas. And uh, we haven't had a war. Now, people could say, well, that's foolish. You're setting the conditions for a future war. Well, I don't know about that. And the more that we can suffocate China's economy so that they can't build more aircraft carriers and nuclear ballistic missile submarines and more anti-ship ballistic missiles and more hypersonic missiles, then I think that's a good thing. And it's actually lessened the tension. You know, the same arguments were made uh, in the Cold War when Ronald Reagan became president and confronted the Soviet Union. People said he was going to start a nuclear war and the opposite happened. So I think history is replete with examples where when good people stand up to bad people, uh, good things happen. What do you make of um, the Philippines recently saying that they would, you know, call on the U.S. if China attacked their Navy? Yeah, I read those uh, statements from uh, Foreign Minister, uh, Foreign Affairs Ministry uh, Secretary Loxon, and I think those are good statements. I'm glad to see them. I am a little bit concerned in some sense of are, are, there, are these statements coming from, you know, the Defense Ministry and the Foreign Affairs Ministry? Uh, but then President Duterte will, you know, in a week or two from now, say something completely different and that he's aligned with China. I don't know. Uh, I just know that from my dealings with the Philippines, I know Philippine people are not happy uh, with the notion that China's running roughshod through their 
territorial, not territorial waters. The Chinese are not operating inside 12 yet, but they're inside their exclusive economic zone and they're basically stealing their economic resources. And they're basically being pushed around uh, by China. And I don't think a lot of the Filipino people like that. Now, domestically, they also like President Duterte. So you've got kind of a two, you know, two, what you would think uh, maybe exclusive uh, camps or uh, uh, things that can't re reconcile themselves. But I'm not sure about that. And these two statements over the last week are encouraging to me in that, that maybe people are finally seeing what we have, you know, guys like us have been warning about, which is to say, once you get in bed with China, they're not all fun and games that they promise you. Uh, you know, a lot of these places I visited last year in the South Pacific, uh, politicians in the Solomon Islands and in Kiribati were promised money uh, from the Chinese, you know, backroom deals and such. And then you come to find out six months, a year, two years later, all these promises haven't been materialized. The big bags of, of cash weren't delivered as they were kind of initially told. So I think people have to be very, very, or nations have to be very uh, cautious about, you know, engaging with China because they don't always follow through. And then when they do, you're beholden to them and you must obey. So what can the U.S. really do to sort of turn back the, the clock with this? I know um, Secretary of Defense Mark Esper has been making a lot of trips to the Indo-Pacific trying to rebuild uh, relations with U.S. allies in the region. Uh, I mean, is it as simple as can the U.S. just build more ships and make missiles with a greater range? No, I mean, I, I talk a lot about that and I get kind of pigeonholed as that's the only solution that I think of. When I was in the military, I see everything in military terms. And that I, I, I do view a lot of it that way, but it's clear, it's absolutely clear that a whole of government approach is required to confront the PRC. And I believe this administration has really done it. I mean, these series of speeches that occurred over the course of the last uh, uh, spring and summer here uh, from you know the vice president, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, the National Security Advisor, the Attorney General, the Director of the FBI, all laid the foundation, built upon the foundation of the 2017 uh, National Security Strategy, the Defense National Defense Strategy. And so I, what you see is from an ideological perspective, this administration has done what no other administration has done in the last 40 years, which is build the ideological justification for why confrontation with China is so absolutely necessary. Then, as we're all aware of, they've done, uh, they've used tariffs and uh, the economic uh, tool uh, to really influence China's market and to really grab their attention and moderate some of their behavior, at least in the economic arena. When it comes to diplomacy, as you mentioned, the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State have been out in the region. Uh, now, there's a lot of critics of this and have said that the administration uh, you know, has failed to work with its allies, it's offended its allies because they've asked them to pay fair share. Uh, but as I mentioned to some folks yesterday, you know, you're criticizing this administration for failing to build up the alliances in uh, Asia, but what about what's going on with the Quad, the, the four nations of India, Australia, Japan, and the United States? I mean, that, the Quad was established in 2007 and basically went fallow for a, a decade. It was not used. It was it was stiff-armed by India, it was stiff-armed by Australia, and Japan, I think, really wanted to be engaged, and the United States did, but there was no there was no consensus there to move forward. And now we have Quad nations operating in naval exercises together and from the Philippine Sea to the Indian Ocean. Uh, you haven't seen that before. We have, you know, exchanges between our, our militaries and officers. We just had this week, uh, it's not exactly the Quad, but you had Australia, uh, Japan and Indonesia talking together in a kind of a quad plus uh, environment. And so I, you can say, well, that's all because of what China's done. And I think there's a lot of truth there that China has caused a lot of these nations to recognize if we don't come together and stand together, we're going to divide, we're going to fall together. But I would, I would tell you that it's really the, uh, the glue that's bound all this together is the hard work of the State Department and the Defense Department and this government standing up to China and leading. And I think that's really emblematic of this whole of government approach that really needs to be done and, and, and materialized even more. We, and we can't have another DOD report that says China uh, has a bigger Navy than the US Navy. Unfortunately, that's what we're gonna get in 2021 and 2022 and 2023 for the next 10 to 15 years because navies 
take a long time to build. I mean, I guess, is there anything that you wish the U.S. were doing better in terms to its response in the South China Sea? Well, I mean, I have some small, you know, pet peeves of mine. Like, I really believe that, uh, for instance, we have this, uh, China has just kind of came out in the last month and announced that they have a South China Sea probing initiative. It's a think tank in Hainan Island, I guess, that uh, their job is to report on uh, U.S. military maneuvers and activity in the Asia-Pacific region. And so apparently for the last couple of months, they've been putting out detailed, uh, what I would call event-by-event -event reporting on the movements of U.S. warships, submarines, aircraft, bombers, fighters in the region. And they're putting out these updates and telling people where the Americans are. Well, several years ago, I wrote a paper uh, with uh, Ryan Martinson it was published in SIMSEC that recommended that the United States get ahead of this and start producing uh, weekly reports that talk about what China is doing, because there was no baseline in the unclassified uh, world that talked about what China has been doing uh, in the inside the first island chain, for instance. Now, I knew about it from my days uh, on active duty, but you could still, from open source reporting, you could piece together some glimpse of what China had done. For instance, in the South China Sea, when I retired, you had a hand, I, mean, I can't give exact numbers, but you've said handful of kind of Chinese Navy ships operating down there. There's much more than that today, you know, double or triple of that on a daily basis. And there's, there's uh, sources and methods that we can collect information. Uh, for instance, when a P3 or a P8 is flying around in the South China Sea and a pilot looks out and sees a, Chinese aircraft carrier, that is not top secret information. And so we could, as a government, derive, uh, you know, reporting that would say, here's what the Chinese are doing in the South China Sea. And not, not any uh, editorializing, not any commentary, just simply the fact of. And then allow our think tanks in America and the international community to have this data from which to develop their own assessments about what's going on. And because we haven't done that, because we haven't laid a foundation, for the, for the Chinese operations in these areas, China is now doing that. And their narrative is, it's the United States that's the aggressor. It's the United States that's militarized the South China Sea, not China. Well, that's a bold-faced lie, but there's no evidence in the unclassified world for us to counter that because we're not documenting it and reporting it. So, you know, think tanks like CSIS and their Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative, they would be the users of this kind of data that could be sanitized so you don't give away sources and methods, but you could at least have a baseline of knowledge of understanding that said, in 2000, there was typically only one Chinese Navy destroyer that was on patrol in the South China Sea at least 50% of the year, let's just say for instance. And then in 2010, it was two destroyers and they were on patrol 24-7, 365. And now in 2020, it's 15 ships 24-7, 365 with bombers and fighters, you know, at this period, this, we could get to that level of understanding and show it empirically that China is the one that's been militarizing the South China Sea and not the United States Navy or the United States. So that's a, that's a peeve of mine that I wish this administration would really go after and have us start talking about that more. And there's concerns. The intelligence community doesn't like to get involved with that because they're afraid they'll give up, you know, sources and methods. But I can tell you from experience, there's a way to do that where you can just give away nothing, but you can give the fact of the presence and allow people to really have a deeper understanding of the trajectory of the PRC and, and really understand who's the aggressor here. Well, you know, it seems like over the years, there's been a lot of failing in like think tanks and the government. And, you know, there's a lot of young people who, who do watch this show and are sort of trying to figure out what to do with their lives. Is there anything you can recommend for the viewers about like, what can they do? Should they start having an eye on becoming a China analyst or getting involved in government somehow? Like, what would you recommend for the, the viewers? Well, the first thing I would do just from a kind of a basic thing is, when I go into stores now and I look at things to buy off the shelf, I always look at it and say, is it made in China? And I know it's almost impossible to get away from that, but I'm trying to, because I know that every dollar that I spend or Swiss franc uh, goes to, in some form or fashion, building a bomb or a bullet that's going to be turned around and used against people that I went to see with or that are still out there. So I don't want to give them any more money. 
Uh, that's kind of a general overall statement. So if you're a young person and you're thinking about what you want to do in your life and career, there's nothing better than to get involved with the study of China uh, and what's going on. They are a big country. They're an important country. Uh, they're a powerful country, and they have <laughs> nefarious intentions, in my opinion. So you couldn't do worse than to study uh, Chinese and to study their history and to study their culture and then come back in and bring it inside the government. If you wanted to be in the military, I'd highly recommend joining the Navy. Uh, Naval intelligence. <laughs> Naval intelligence loves to have people like that, and I can tell you it's a great career, and, uh, and there's a lot of fun things to do. And if you like to track ships and submarines and aircraft at sea, you can do that in your career. And, and I you might even get to live in Hawaii like you did. You you definitely can live in Hawaii if you if you join Naval intelligence and you're focused on Asia, uh, <laughs> and in Japan and and in Asia. But uh, it's a great it's 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 interesting. It could be very dangerous, but it also if we have more people in, engaged in this and more people willing to stand up and push back against China, and China can recognize that and recalculate their plans, uh, then I think we're going to be okay. All right, Jim, thanks again for joining us. It's always insightful having you on. Always a pleasure. Well, it's, it's been my pleasure, and I wish you guys a very happy uh, Labor Day weekend. Yeah, you too. You know, I always love talking to Jim. He leaves me with such a sense of optimism. Yeah, I'm suddenly way worried, more worried about a war with Ta over Taiwan now than I was before. I thought about the whole they could use the South China Sea as a like, you know, southern a vector entry. of attack. Yes. Though I don't know. Like I feel like the lesson we've learned over the past several years is, you know, the old school of thought was, oh, we can't, we can't confront China because it could lead to a war, it could lead to bad things. And yet, after at least three and a half years of like seriously confronting the Chinese Communist Party. It hasn't led to war. I think they are not yet at a stage where if we stand up to this bully, I think they'll fold. Well, I think it's partially what Jim was saying in terms of there's a difference between having a whole of government response mm -hmm. and just having a military response to it. Absolutely. And one thing is clear. If the U.S. doesn't do anything, someday there will be a war. Because China, if China can surpass the U.S., that's when they're going to they're gonna use their military for something. Yeah, and I, I don't think that the choice is like, you know, oh, you know, either we go to war or there's peace. Like, it's not really a choice between war and peace with China. I think it's a choice between surrender and standing up for what's good for the U.S. and what's good for our allies. So... The choice is surrender versus stand up. And when you look at it in that frame, like we have to do something, we have to respond. Each time there's a new thin salami slice, as, as Jim mentioned, uh, that the Chinese Communist Party does, we have to be there and, and stand up to it. Otherwise, we are basically surrendering to that. Amen to that. So what are you going to do? Thanks for watching China Unscripted. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelly Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesda. Is that like a recruitment video? <laughs>